gives me great pleasure if I may formally uh, open the webinar and above all welcome everyone to this. We have a huge amount of interest in what is a very important and challenging topic of multimodal cross-border travel. It's a huge uh, issue in Brussels, as it is throughout the whole of Europe and indeed the world, about the need to try and take decisive action to move forward in making multimodal cross-border travel easier for everyone, uh, particularly in regard to uh, focusing on more sustainable journeys. This uh, webinar hosted by BT for Europe is being recorded. As you probably all know, BT for Europe is the European network of business travel associations. And this event is supported by Visa, who, who've made it possible. Um, I'm Mark Watts. I'm a former member of the European Parliament, and it's my honour today to uh, moderate this webinar on BT on behalf of BT for Europe. We have two amazing, fantastic participants, uh, Jakob Dolunda, MEP, who is a member of the European Parliament and sits on the Transport and Tourism Committee, where he's been very active in this mandate. Welcome, uh, Jakob. Um, we also have Frederick uh, Hermelen, uh, um, who is our, the BT for Europe's in-house expert on multimodal cross-border travel and is also the general manager of the Swedish Business Travel Association. Welcome to you, uh, Frederick. We look forward to hearing from you both your opinions on what next for cross-border travel. Uh, but before we do that, it gives me also great pleasure to uh, invite uh, Patrick Diemer, to uh, say a few words in regard to the mission of BT for Europe. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, BT for Europe is the European network of business travel associations, which traditionally have been very strong in advocating business travel interest in the various countries across Europe. And two years ago, we came together from various European countries to form um, this association in Brussels to give business travel a strong voice when legislation is being made uh, in Brussels. Of course, we all understand that um, the pan-European legislation is ever becoming more important for um, every aspect of our lives and business travel is just one of them. So we felt that the voice of the buyers of business travel in particular need to be heard in Brussels and this is um, this is our raison d'être, um, the raison d'être for BT for Europe. Uh, we have two main main priorities we follow, and both come together nicely today at this webinar. One is sustainability. We promote and we want greener business travel, and the other one is digital transformation. We would like to use the the technology to make business travel easier and with less paperwork and with less administration. And here I close it. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Mark, to say a word. Well, thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Patrick Diemer there, who's the chair of BT uh, for Europe on BT for Europe's uh, mission. We're now going to uh, start our discussion uh, with uh, Jakob and uh, Frederick. But just before we do, just remind everyone, we want this to be as participatory uh, as possible. You can use the Q&A function to submit questions to uh, our experts. I encourage you to do that. We already have plenty of questions, but it'd be great to get your comments uh, included in our discussion too. We've got just under the hour to uh, discuss what is, a, as I mentioned earlier, a very important uh, subject. But before we get into that, um, there was some discussion uh, in, in the introduction about uh, Jakob Dolunda and your time here in Brussels. And there's been a, as you know, you've got a big fan base, people following you, your work in the European Parliament, uh, as a Swedish MEP, but also very active on the Transport Committee in particular. But unfortunately, we understand your term as an MEP will be coming to an end uh, very, very soon. Perhaps before we talk about MDMS, could you perhaps look back briefly about your agenda, uh, why you came to the European Parliament and what you think you were able to achieve, Jakob? So I, I ran for the European Parliament 10 years ago, uh, back in 2014, on trying to fix the European ra railways. And that was why I ran and that was what I've spent most of my time uh, doing. And while there, of course, are many colleagues who are also interested in fixing Europe, Europe's railways, uh, there hasn't been too many of us focused on the specific issue on multimodal ticketing and making it easier to book train tickets cross-border and, and sort of solving that puzzle. Um, and so that's what I've spent a lot of time doing in the previous mandate, 
um, we had the commission on uh, the commission proposal on rail passenger rights, which was mainly targeted towards uh, uh, coordinating and harmonizing European legislation and, and regulation with regards to uh, delays and making sure that the passengers are compensated uh, after delays. But we actually managed to increase the scope of that legislation, at least in the parla Parliament's position, introducing language mandating all Europe's uh, railway operators to have open uh, ticketing systems. However, that died uh, in the trilogues when, when the Council uh, did, didn't have any appetite. But what was interesting was that the Commission took notice in the language introduced by me in the Parliament's process. And they knocked on my door and said, Jakob, we actually like this uh, and we're going to take a swing at it during uh, this term. And, and therefore we hoped that um, uh, that language would, would have been included uh, in the Commission's proposal for MDMS. But uh, from what I understand, there was quite a bit of um, internal um, decision making within the Commission with various commissioners pulling in, in different paths and uh, and in the end uh, we didn't have a proposal uh, at all and for that I am I'm, I'm quite sad but I do hope that we will have uh, progress on this issue in the next mandate. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're going to explore the details of what went wrong, what went right uh, during the course of the next uh, 50 minutes. And obviously, we're interested in what Frederick's point of view, but uh, clearly a lot of momentum has been generated and there's high expectations for action sooner rather than later, particularly in the, the next mandate. Well, we'll come on to that. But if I can bring you, Frederick, in, I mean, I think what would be helpful to our audience in particular, maybe just sort of in plain language, what is it we are talking about from a business travel point of view? What is this concept of cross-border multimodal travel and the need to try and remove some of the barriers what does it mean in everyday language thank you very much mark and and um i i actually share uh, mr Dalun's passion for 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 developing a uh, european railway uh being born in the 70s interrailing was a big thing back then uh, and and today when i'm looking at it from a business travel point of view there are so many great opportunities but first of all mark uh, three things uh, is combined in this multimodal cross-border uh, travel um the ability to combine different types of transport into one ticket all across Europe so you can book multimodal transport and have one ticket issued no no matter where you are based and you buy and purchase it the digitalization as as, as Patrick mentioned is creating that seamless digital solution for any cross-border traveler today uh, work visas a1 tax forms administration it has to become much more easier than what it is today and it's all ties together and the very uh, third thing here is the sustainability making sure that with the multimodal travel all travelers have a better overview and ability to choose based on criteria such as CO2 emissions. So, Mark, today we are looking into the MDMS, the ability to plan and buy tickets for journeys that combined different modes of transport all across Europe. That is the core. And with that comes the ability to compare in an easy way uh, a broader availability of different travel options, including boat flights and rails and, and other uh, land transportations, to be, to be fair. <laughs> Travelers can then combine what is the best fit for their purpose of travel uh, and, and the objective in, in, in sense is really to make a more sustainable uh, selection uh, for travelers around Europe. That is what it is all about. Thanks, Frederick, for that very clear explanation why it's so important and uh, what is the, uh, the the ultimate destination. If I could bring Jakob back in, it was very interesting to hear that you arrived with that ambition to improve Europe's railways and uh, towards uh, the last few years, at least try and improve the connectivity and the ability to combine tickets, particularly across cross borders. Um, so just taking you back to to what was basically, I think, think from it seemed from the outside very hard to decipher really what went wrong almost. I mean, it seemed like a great idea, a lot of support. But as you say, there seem to be different views within the Commission. Before we perhaps get on to how we can fix this, it's always good to know what you think went wrong. What 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 was the, what is the problem here? Because I think for many of us, this is just common sense. Yeah, we want to improve uh, ticketing options, of uh, transparency, connectivity, cross-border travel, particularly by rail. 
almost what can possibly go wrong. Jakob, do you want to explain what, what in your view, went wrong? Well, if we go back to the previous mandate, um, a little more than five years ago, it was actually surprisingly easy to get political support within the European Parliament on having open uh, ticketing systems and mandating all the op train, op train operators to have open ticketing systems so that uh, third party vendors could search and have full access to the booking systems and then enable the end consumer to easily compare um, the alternatives and book a cohesive uh, journey where the where your rights as a passenger uh, go along with you th all throughout the various legs of that of that journey. Uh, because when I when I mentioned this issue to my left wing colleagues, they were all in favor because they thought it would benefit the consumer and it would benefit railways. It, more ra railway traveling. And when I when I spoke about the issue with my right wing colleagues, they saw it as market uh, policy competition. Uh, so everybody was in favor. And the, my amendment passed uh, Parliament quite easily, surprisingly easily. However, when we entered the trilogues, because in, in I don't know how, how the audience knows about European leg legislation, but for something to become European law, both the Parliament and the Council, where the member states are represented, both need to agree on the very same language. Otherwise, nothing happens. So in the Parliament's position, we had actually quite ambitious uh, text. But when, when we met with the Council, almost every member state were against it. Uh, I think because they listened to their national incumbent railway operators, who sadly, most of them are against this proposal. Because from their perspective, they look at the hotel sector, they looked at the aviation sector, where services like Booking.com, Hotels.com, Skyscanner, Kayak and Mamondo mm. all have made it much easier for the, end, for the end consumer to see the alternatives and be empowered to make your own choice. And most of the European railway, ra railway operators don't want to be compared. They want to own the entire consumer relationship uh, and they would rather uh, maintain that uh, over expanding the the entire pie of the market. So, so therefore, uh, th that process died uh, in the previous mandate. But the Commission, as I mentioned earlier, were keen on trying to solve this issue. Um, and in the Commission, from what I understand, there was a big uh, debate whether to go this this ambitious approach that I was in favor um, on on enabling. Uh, third-party vendors to be to be a more uh, prominent uh, part in this process, um, or the the smaller pros uh, the, the less ambitious approach, which which was so-called relinking, which meant that you would mandate all the operators to show the alternatives, but not mandate them to enable the consumer to actually make the purchasing decision, but rather link you onwards to the other vendors. But the problem with that approach is that you, you end up with a patchwork mm -hmm. uh, solution, which makes it quite difficult uh, for the end user uh, to manage that. Um, and only the real enthusiasts uh, like myself uh, can maybe solve it, or the really uh, ambitious company who, who pay extra for their traveling agency uh, to do it. But but to be honest, not even the European Parliament's own traveling agency can handle this issue. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite sad. Yeah, and I think we'll probably come on onto this project when we bring you back about how difficult it is for even big, big business organisations to book multimodal ticketing cross-border ticketing it's 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 a huge problem and it should be i think we all agree should be a lot easier but before we bring you back in Fred, just to explore that uh, problem a little bit further jacob i remember i remember i was an mep a long long time ago but we were discussing these issues even then um and i think our dream then a few decades ago was that we would have a single market in in the rail sector you know the railways should not be immune for the single market they should be integrated into the single market we have a single european railway area um, now, I think what you're saying is the experience is these, the incumbents are acting in a way almost against their own interests. We want to grow, grow rail. That's what we're all discussing here today. We want to use more sustainable modes, particularly given the climate crisis. 
Again, Jakob, I know you, you can't speak for them, but any insight you can share with us on why you think they are acting against what appears to be their own interests in supporting a tool, a device, a methodology that would actually boost rail travel in Europe? Well, first of all, I don't want to paint all the European railway operators operators with a, with a single brush. Uh, some are actually part of, the, of, of leading this transition and some are actively lobbying um, against it, but but I mean from a from a very short term perspective, I can understand the most railway operators since for most operators domestic travel is between ninety or ninety five percent of the of the business, and for them to do all the work and all the hassle of reshaping their ticketing systems to enable uh, a portion of traffic that for them is a very small part of the business. I, can, I, I do understand some of the resistance, but from my perspective, in order to really solve the climate crisis with regards to the emissions and environmental impact from transport, that part of the transport sector ne really needs to dramatically uh, grow the cross-border uh, traveling, and not only for entirely uh, railway, but also in multimodal. Uh, that that part of traffic uh, really needs to grow, and I do hope that um, more and more railway operators will um, see the benefits in growing the market uh, over time, and not only narrowly focusing on the short-term uh, profit margins that you can enjoy if your if your end consumers cannot see or choose the competition. Well, thanks, for, Jakob, for that explanation. Bringing you back uh, in, Frederick, if I may, particularly from a business travel perspective, and why does that element of cross-border travel by rail, in, in this case, this is the focus of the discussion, why does that really matter to business? Well, I, I must say that I'm quite uh, pleased to hear um, out in Europe today, we have about 50 uh, uh, rail companies operating across Europe, and I know that about 13, 14 of them has actually started a, a very a, a strong uh, cooperation together to, to see how they can solve this uh, cross-border uh, with one uh, common uh, distribution channel. Um, but when we're looking at this from a business travel perspective, um, we have to also know that every fifth traveler out in Europe are a business traveler. And the most reliable data we have uh, is from 2022, where we saw about 300 million business trips across Europe. It's massive numbers in, 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 in numbers of, of trips uh, being made. We also know that a lot of the, the railway companies are running today at 95, 96% capacity. So they actually are already maxed out in what they can, what they can do. Uh, others uh, are, are, are in, in much lower and they are of course fighting to get more more traffic in, in different ways. Uh, but in order to steer this for the greater benefit in the future of having a better selection and, and for the environmental uh, uh, process to, to become much better, um, we have to, to start somewhere. And I believe that looking at this from a business travel perspective, 60% of business travelers are today by statistics booking via a managed channel. There is a policy, there is a travel agency, there is a system set up uh, and, and they can load all these products and, 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 and services that they would like to have into their online booking tool. And with that integration, it makes it easier to plan and execute a complex travel itinerary. And for the business traveler now with the CRSD, CR, CSRD uh, uh, emission uh, data report, many companies are driving extensive tier two reporting and they are forcing their business traveler to make the best sustainable choice for their travel. So we do see a big shift in, in the desire of booking the right product. However, the third party vendors are out there, but then you have also uh, consumer legislation and you you don't have that online ticketing and one ticket fits all. Uh, I believe having the corporate business traveler as a good starting point is, is the best way to go. And MDMS can help reduce the carbon footprint uh, and, and associate that with all the business travel that we see out there. Uh, so 
when they focus, they focus on cost, they focus on time, they focus on safety, and, and business travelers are focusing on sustainability. And that is really where we have to, to, to drive this forward uh, in, in that sense. Thanks, Roger. Uh, no doubt the discussion uh, will continue. I do invite everyone to submit any questions via the Q&A function. But if we can now, based on that understanding, better understanding, at least I have, of uh, how important this is, Jakob, but also some of the hurdles it confronted in the last, uh, this, this current mandate. And as you say, Frederick, how important it is to the business sector, indeed how important business is to the transport sector and how you want to drive uh, modal shift and change to more sustainable options. If we can now look to the to the future, to, to that new mandate, we have elections coming up in, in June across uh, Europe. Turning to, to you, uh, Jakob, MDMS now is firmly, sadly, you know, sitting on a shelf. Um, but do you think, given what we've all been saying, how important this is, do you think it will be a priority for the new parliament? And it looks like it has been for the last one. And will it be a priority for the new commission, despite all the hurdles it's uh, encountered this time? A bit of well, crystal ball gazing, I know, but it's still important. Well, I, I truly hope that um, that the European people will elect members of the European Parliament who will care deeply about this issue uh, and who are passionate on it, because this is an issue where you not only need to be sort of convinced, you also need to be dedicated uh, because it, it, it is an issue that needs uh, passionate sponsors, uh, actors who are, who are driving it, because it's a, otherwise it risks the flying uh, beneath the radar, because most people aren't even aware um, that this issue exists. When I speak with colleagues in the European Parliament who are generally in favour of making it easier for people uh, to, to make sustain, sustainable mobility choices, because I mean, most people who um, travel uh, by rail do so domestically. And when you're going cross-border, generally you're choosing aviation. So, so it, most of my colleagues are not even aware that this is an issue that needs to be solved. So we need to elect members of the European Parliament who care deeply about it, who are passionate and have knowledge uh, on it, and who will then in turn demand it in the future commission. because. Um, after the elections, there will be hearings where uh, incoming commissioners will have to face scrutiny by the parliament. Um, and I hope that there will be members of the European Parliament who will require, who will demand from the incoming uh, transport commissioner to promise ambitious uh, MDMS uh, legislation during uh, next term. Yeah. Well, and I think um, that's very, very clear. I mean, remind everyone we have, I think, Europe election 6th, the 9th of June. Incredibly important issue for Europe, particularly given the current geopolitical situation, but also incredibly important also for the business community to maybe get across some of these messages during the campaign and to candidates that this issue doesn't need to sit on the shelf. It needs to be addressed as a as a, as a matter of priority. Maybe bring you in, 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 Frederick, about, I mean, businesses obviously traditionally don't particularly like getting political and obviously not party political. But I guess this European election to some extent and this new mandate matters to you more than ever before because you want this issue fixed as a priority. Do you want to maybe just explain you know, what what uh, what you're hoping for in the next mandate? Well, we are a whole bunch of organizations, associations and companies around Europe who has several times been in Brussels to talk to 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 different commissioners and 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 to 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 um uh, people who we believe are the stakeholders for the future and and one of the very positive thing is that everybody seems to accept and and know that this is a part of the future it needs to be it makes sense it's relevant um that is very promising what we very often encounter in that situation is that we get a lot of devil's advocate questions about what if what if what if and how and and, and how can this be done so it doesn't really matter how well equipped we are there's always going to be more questions but i believe that the dialogue 
moving forward is the most important. And also that we are looking to break through that first sense of making a decision to start changing something. Um, there are so many great forces out there and so many great proposals on the table where to start. Um, we have also seen some of the countries in Europe starting to consider banning flying on, on certain uh, city stretches where train is a better option, like two and a half hours of, 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 of a train ride, then you have to choose the train. And there is so many different ideas and thoughts around that. But and, and, and probably banning is not the right way to go down and looking at it. But my hope for the next term is to continue the dialogue, get a crack on on a first decision to move in the right direction, and then we will start leading on mm -hmm. from there. Okay, well, th thanks, Roger, for what what your hope is for the next mandate. Obviously, we're going to explore that a little bit more. But just coming back to you, Jakob, on on one of those devil ad devil's advocate questions that no, no gets thrown to us, uh, thrown to BT for Europe. And that's basically you should only really intervene when the market is failing, and the market isn't failing. And in in any event, it's better surely to have a voluntary solution to let the market drive this change, rather than having an overburdensome regulatory approach. Now. That's not necessarily my view or BT for Europe's view, but I'm paraphrasing what is often said by some of the critics here, that they may be maybe dressing up vested interests, but they do nonetheless have a coherent argument, do they not, Jakob, that where there is market failure, isn't it better that the market in the first instance corrects that failure? I mean, uh, I would uh, love nothing else than to not have to uh, be a politician. Uh, I, I would just love if everything in society would just solve itself without regulation. I could go fishing or skiing or, or do something else with my life. But unfortunately, that, that's not the case. And, and uh, yes, some operators are starting to move in the right direction, seeing where the wind is blowing, realizing that eventually there will be regulation. So let's get in line for that. At the same time, seeing a more strong uh, customer uh, interest and, and wanting wanting to be perceived as a leader and thrive uh, in a society where we travel more sustainably uh, cross border, but it's going uh, too slow uh, in, in my opinion. Of course, the ticketing issue is not the only thing standing away for more sustainable choices. Uh, we still have the issue that um, the less sustainable modes of transportation are not yet. Uh, paying for their environment for their environmental impact. However, that that is changing now. The ETS revisions, the decisions that we are taking during this mandate, which puts uh, a stronger CO2 price on the emissions from aviation, from shipping, from road transport, that mm. will start to have effect, and the pricing will start to become more uh, fair. Then the ticketing issue becomes even more important to make sure that all those who want to travel more sustainably and benefit in doing so also economically uh, will have the uh, will have the possibility to do so but uh, but i really hope that we don't need regulation uh, but um, sometimes regulation can actually create a better functioning market not always but sometimes regulation can be in service of a functioning market. And I do believe that this is a, such a case. I actually <laughs> believe, sorry, I, I actually do believe from, from listening to a lot of suppliers and, and vendors out there, there are already some solutions for revenue growth in, in, in a different uh, market structure than what we see today. So I believe a lot of these suppliers out there are already preparing for, for the change when that change happens. And they're looking into how can we make money if we need to to do this multimodal and maybe share transport between each other differently. But then we can make money on different ways of selling things on the website and, and we can capture the travelers in a whole different scope. Uh, there are a lot of forces out there already preparing for that change, Jacob, uh, which is very positive mm -hmm. in my in my world. Mm -hmm. I was going to thank thanks for that. We've got a couple of questions in the chat function that, that relate to how we can push this forward. I mean, what, one of them is what can people like BT for Europe and association, what can BT for Europe and associations like BT for Europe do to make sure this issue gets the attention it deserves in the in the next year and indeed in the whole the next mandate. But also we've got a question in on the chat or the Q&A. 
What can we as travel managers do to put pressure behind uh, getting MDMS high on the agenda? I mean, Jakob, you already referred to the election campaign. That's important. But what can we do regarding DG Move and those European Parliament hearings? I mean, are there practical things for citizens and organisations, companies and associations, how they can get involved in this campaign? Are there practical things? You know, where where are the? I think one of the the, the challenges is often people don't know they ha they have a voice, but they don't know how to exercise that voice. Uh, EU seems very complicated, very uh, remote. What would they? What, from a practical point of view, a bit of advice, Jakob, or what could they actually do? Well, from my point of view, this is an issue that is really about the attention. If we want this issue to move forward, we need attention on it. Mm. Um, it, because if I've learned something of my 20 years in politics is that the bandwidth of decision making is not endless. Uh, a political organization cannot tackle all uh, issues at once. Um, and just, just look at how um, the war in Israel and Gaza is taking focus away from the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. The political system cannot do everything at once. So if we want this issue uh, to move forward, we need more attention on it. We need yeah. to have more events organized on the issue. We need to invite uh, leading candidates uh, from all the parties all over Europe to events to be questioned on it, to need to take a stand on it um, and, and to realize uh, that this is an important issue um, and make them promise uh, to, uh, to deliver on it. So uh, it's really an issue that requires stakeholders to reach out to members of, of incoming members of European Parliament and incoming uh, commissioners uh, in the selection campaign and also after the election. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there we are. Clear advice there from Jakob, which hopefully those that put the questions into the chat and the Q&A uh, will, will uh, heed. Uh, Frederick, you want to come in on, on that? What, what, what uh, BTV and others can practically do to help and also travel managers, which was yeah. the question in the Q&A. The beauty with the, the travel managers and, and, and the corporate side of this is that it is mandated in a way that we actually do have associations, we have members, we have voices, and those voices are identified. They're identified with, with data and spend. We understand how much money this is about. We understand how many people uh, uh, th this will be affected by. And, and I also strongly believe that if we can get that unified voice from the associations and, and companies uh, to raise that voice, we want this, we see this benefit, this would be good for us, uh, then I would believe that suppliers and, 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 and uh, companies out there would listen and, and start making those uh, changes. Com com combined with Jacob's broader activity on, on, on making the, the headline and, and the focus on, on, the, top, on the topic. Hmm. Very clear advice and obviously a good consensus there between uh, both of you. Uh, another question that's coming on the Q&A is, uh, are there lessons we can learn and apply from the aviation industry um, uh, who are much more active in terms of, obviously, as Jakob said, the, the, often the mode of choice is you go for the plane. Why has aviation managed to tackle this issue and become more uh, integrated in, in a sense? Um, are there aspects of aviation we could learn from and apply them to rail? Either of you want to want to tackle that one, and again, as a as a someone on the business side, what what it's, is about tra traveling by air that's so much better in terms of the booking and the the integrated systems? We have to look into very quickly. That is a fantastic question, by the way. Thank you for for asking that because aviation is is a multi complex uh, industry uh, run by uh, companies with a strong revenue focus, of course. Um, but what they don't have in in that sense, they are not uh, bound to the railways and the and and the infrastructure that the rail companies have. So it's a whole different infrastructural uh, setup. The air is free. You need the airports and the hubs to. To, to feed that infrastructure, but but the railway is is a whole different and and, and much more complex setup. Uh, I do believe we see changes in the aviation right now as well. We are changing the NDC, the way we distribute and 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 make bookings, the way we sell airline tickets and and services is now changing. That creates a, a certain buzz in the market, uh, and, and of course uncomfortable, but it will be better eventually. Uh, I, I do believe there are great synergies 
strategies for train and air to to be looked at and and maybe for the train train to be more modern and 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 start uh, looking into that so yeah it's difficult but it's a great question we have some more coming in Yako. i don't know whether you want to wade in particularly on the role of iata and whether their model should be followed. We've got other people coming in on the chat is generating quite a lot of uh, debate, which is good, saying maybe uh, ERT is not the neutral body that some uh, claim it to be. But but any, any views there on Jakob on aviation, the ERT model, and uh, whether or not we can adapt some of their uh, success in uh, providing people with uh, easy to access ticketing solutions. There is a point that, though, again, it's coming on the chat. Yeah, but what about the carbon footprint and all that? Should be more transparency on that. And I know there is the counter emissions EU proposal going in or going through the parliament at the moment, which might address that issue. But yeah, Jakob, any view on, on aviation learning lesson from IATA? Well, I think part of the reason why we solved this issue in aviation, but did not in railway, uh, has the background. If you, if you look at the, the situation in the 90s, when we, when we uh, changed both deregulated and regulated, uh, the aviation sector to be more competitive um, and to have more competition uh, was that for, for, for most consumers, when you travel by rail, you travel within a member state. And in most countries, you have a single railway company that takes you all the way. So the need to have regulation that enforces cooperation uh, is, is quite little. But for aviation, you're going all across the globe. And it's very few uh, aviation carriers that can take you from every single city to every other single city in the rest of the world. Yes, of course, if you're in Germany and you have Lufthansa, you can travel uh, quite a lot. But if you're from Sweden, uh, Scandinavian Airlines doesn't take you all across the world. So it's actually quite natural that there has to be uh, cooperation between the airlines and the need for regulation to make sure that that cooperation uh, is managed in a fair uh, way. And that that is the regulation that we had in the 90s, which of course um, pushed down prices quite a lot in Europe. If you compare the aviation cost in Europe and Latin America, it's dramatically cheaper to go by aviation in Europe than in Latin America, even though it should be more cheaply to, to travel in Latin America because the labor costs are lower, there's less uh, environmental and social regulation, so it, so it should be more cheaper to, to fly there. But because um, of the national carriers in, um, in Latin America and, and the lack of um, enforced competition and regulation, then it becomes more expensive. Um, and 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 that is the and and in the railway sector in Europe we are sort of in the same situation that the aviation sector still is in Latin America, uh, and that to some extent is part of the explanation explanation why why so little is happening. But but now when we are finally starting to see more and more both uh, private consumers but also business consumers wanting to travel uh, multimodal cross border, we're finally starting to see. Uh, this push and I really hope that uh, whenever uh, somebody does this journey and is successful that they that they speak about it and, and become evangelists mm -hmm. but also when they try to do so but fail that they become angry voters and demand change. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you, Jakob. In fact, there's, there's there's quite a good question in on on the need for more people to, to be experienced cross border journeys by rail to see how challenging it is. I mean, it's a specific question about actually MEPs that maybe MEPs should be encouraged or even forced to carry out their journeys uh, by rail. I mean, you already mentioned that maybe that even the Parliament's booking system itself isn't terribly good at offering uh, cross border rail journeys as an option. What what, what Sorry, is your experience? there because we are actually yeah. de incentivized to choose railway, right. uh, because, because um, the way I, it's, it's a long discussion to, to explain how the, um, the, the sort of um, allowance system is, 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 per, is developed, but it actually incentivizes you to go by aviation rather than railway. Uh, you also need to book the, the, uh, the ticket yourself and you need to do a lot of paperwork for the reimbursement yourself. But if you go by aviation, you can just say, well, I want to go between Stockholm and Brussels by aviation. You get the ticket, you get the reimbursement automatically. No hassle, no paperwork. The, the difference is so enormous uh, for, for, for the end consumer within the parliament. 
And I can just imagine that it's a very similar case for so many business travelers all mm. across Europe who, when they contact uh, either their own services within the company or, or, or the consultancy, that if they choose aviation, everything is smooth, everything is easy. easy. But if you want to uh, take the train, it's such a hassle and it becomes more difficult for you as, as the end, end consumer, even if it's for, for business travel. Well, the, another call to action then to maybe fix the uh, parliament system, but of course that's also contingent on an MDMS proposal that allows the system to provide that degree of uh, of, of choice and uh, and, and accessibility. Um, again, many thanks to all the questions and the comments coming in. I know some of our colleagues are answering them in the chat function as well. So thank you to those at BT for Europe uh, uh, colleagues answering them. And if we can't answer them all, we will come back to you by email or do check out the BT for Europe. Uh, website btforeurope.com uh, to email us directly and we'll be uh, pleased to try and answer your inquiries. A uh, couple of questions on on, on Patrick, uh, so on Frederick, on, on the specific, uh, what what is it, looking at the mandate, we've talked a lot about an MDMS proposal, but what are absolutely the bottom line things you want to see in that proposal? Um, what is it that is going to make the difference in a tangible way that uh, travel managers can use? What are those precise technical tools? Bearing in mind what you said earlier, a lot of people in the chat are saying this, surely with all the new technology coming in, we must be able to do better. So what is it you're really looking for from a technical point of view? To, to be very fair to say, and I think also uh, Jacob mentioned it already in the beginning, the technology is actually already developed and 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 in in ready for for the consumers to use. There's a lot of third party uh, uh, suppliers out there who has invested quite a lot in order to to give the consumers the ability to 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 book uh, multimodal. <clears throat> But the problem is definitely is the end-to-end -end service. Uh, and if you want to book one ticket across Europe with multimodal, and you want to have one ticket, you also need to have one uh, uh, set of consumer legislation, uh, and then you need to be protected as a consumer. Um, so first of all, I, I would love to see a, a solution where we solve a very fair uh, uh, consumer legislation around booking multimodal, because the technology is there and the business travelers using different online booking tools with the travel agencies they can also book air and rail and combine them however these will always be uh, separate transactions and they will not be end-to-end -end protected on, on on the consumer legislation so first of all there has to be a, a an overarching uh, legislation on how to do this commercially uh, and then, of course, uh, we need to look into the different parties. We have the airlines and the railways. They need to start collaborating, of course, and finding a common ground where they can actually start s selling a, a multimodal combination. Uh, it might not have to be everything at once. It doesn't have to be open for everyone and forced onto everyone. But at some point, I believe we need to start identifying city pairs, destinations, places where it makes perfect sense to, to use certain uh, uh, transportation in a way rather than always considering air or rail or boat or train or car. Uh, so I believe uh, we need to start seeing some sort of movements of, 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 of that uh, and, and then combine that with the commercial forces of the suppliers and, and then connect the technology together. Uh, and and uh, to me it, it seems easy but I know it comes down to legislation at the end and it has to be fair and that is where we need to to crack the code well thanks Frederick. i hope that's answered some of the questions we've had in the q a in the chat um in terms of what bt Fib is looking for in terms of the uh, next uh, the, the the next mandate for the mdms proposal specific question maybe uh jacob you could handle because i think a lot of people don't understand this about if, if often if you want to make a cross-border journey a multimodal journey you're relying on two or more rail operators and I don't think anyone is clear really what happens if on journey one you're delayed by one rail operator so you miss the connection on journey two by a different operator when you mentioned there was the passenger rights proposal going through under this mandate and, and there was a toughened passenger regulation passenger rights regulation actually was was came into force under this mandate I don't think anyone is clear though on what their passenger rights are and what is a pretty fundamental issue of just a, a connecting journey across a border. I mean, what Do you know the answer to that, Jacob? Maybe it's an unfair question, but why is there a lack of clarity even on passenger rights on the railway? 
because um, the, the agreement that we had in the previous mandate on rail passenger rights, some of it has quite ambitious language, but with a lot of loopholes that enables the railway carrier not to have to follow it uh, if it's too tricky or too expensive and so on, which creates unclarity for the for the end consumer. However, we have seen some improvements. Uh, there has been bilateral uh, agreements between many European railway operators uh, on the uh, agreement on uh, journey continuation, which means that if you, if you, for example, travel from uh, Stockholm to Hamburg with uh, SJ, the, the Swedish railway, and you already have a booked a ticket with Deutsche Bahn, since those two have a bilateral agreement, you're safe. But you're required to know that. You 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 don't. If the delay happens, there is nobody telling you. Oh, by the way, uh, if you have a uh, if you have another uh, journey lined up, and if it if it is with this specific railway company, then you can just hop on the next train, even if it's not the next, if even if it's not the one that you booked. So it's a lack of clarity uh, for the end uh, consumer. So even though it's good that this agreement now exists between many railway operators, we still have a long way to go until this is uh, clear and present um, uh, for the end consumer. OK, well, thanks for that. It's a challenging uh, situation, clearly, although I think we would all hope that it's not impossible to uh, to improve that. Again, looking forward to, to, to the next mandate. I mean, so sadly, you, you will not be there in the parliament uh, fighting this good fight. Um, but who, who you refer to, you hope the voters in, you know, will take this into account and mobilise candidates and support candidates that will take this issue seriously and make it a, a priority. But in terms of your current colleagues from across the political spectrum, across the member states, I mean, are, are there people there that will carry on this this fight uh, that you're, you're hoping will uh, heed your call that this should continue to be a priority? Well, I mean, who uh, should we be a, speak there's, yeah, a, there's a German uh, MVP, uh, Jean-Christophe Hutchins, um, who, is a, who is a free market liberal. Uh, we don't agree on too many issues other than this one. Uh, <laughs> and if there would have been uh, an MDMS proposal, most likely me and, and John Christoph would have been the leading MPs on this issue. And we, ha we have held events in European Parliament uh, together. Um, and um, I mean, I come to this issue from a consumer perspective and a pro-railway concept perspective. He comes to this issue on a free market uh, competition perspective. And we would have made a great pair uh, working on this issue. So uh, I hope that he will uh, keep doing the good fight in the next uh, term and that there will be another um, MEP um, being there uh, working on this issue. So we need to find them and we need to mobilize um, for them. So, so find your MEP and, and support him or her. Yeah, well, very clear advice there, uh, uh, yeah, Jakob, in terms of uh, finding the MEPs and making this obviously an issue in the in the campaign uh, it, itself. Frederick, do you, do you want to come in on that? Obviously, you, you know, you're you're uh, you're working in Sweden, Swedish organisation. Uh, maybe that's a point for business travel organisations and TM, TMCs and others across the member states that they should be working with the parties now uh, and speaking to uh, candidates. Uh, is that something that's happening in Sweden and elsewhere? I, I I don't know actually. It's a very uh, it's a good question which I don't really have a good answer to. Unfortunately, I I do know that that we are of course uh, very happy to have been invited several times in in Brussels mm -hmm. to talk to the Director General Magda Kopczynski. Latest there was a very positive tone that this will be carried on, and we are definitely hoping that we can find uh, uh, the next person, the MEP, and and drive this forward with, with the friends of MD mess and the associations across Europe uh, and, and and it crystallizes more and more uh, as we speak and and I think that uh, we all want to find a solution in the in the next couple of years on this fully yeah and we are focusing many on on, on, on MDMS uh, on this webinar but also we've touched on to, on passenger rights are there any other issues that also matter in regard to transport and business you refer to digitalization uh, Frederick but anything else Jakob do you think the community of business travel organizations that are concerned about environmental impact are concerned about uh, competitiveness are concerned about giving maximum consumer choice but also 
you know, having regard to we need, you know, we need uh, railway companies and airlines that serve their their domestic base as well. We want to we want a common sense solution. In other words, are there other issues we should be keeping an eye out for? Well, I I am mainly coming to this issue from the railway perspective, um, and to some extent also uh, on the railway to a aviation. Uh, perspective to make sure that we have uh, less connecting flights. So you take the railway from one city to the other and then continue with with aviation. But MDMS also makes sense for um, uh, aviation only journeys, because currently if you're traveling from, let's say, uh, Stockholm to Tokyo uh, by aviation and you and you search all the alternatives, you see a lot of connecting flights. But usually those connecting flights are only within um, the coalitions of airway operators that usually cooperate together. You usually don't see connecting flights with uh, all the, the various alternatives. And if we would have regulation that would mandate better cooperation between all aviation operators, then so many other new alternatives will emerge and many with maybe shorter total journeys so that the emissions could actually be reduced because you're choosing uh, a better combination of uh, of uh, airway uh, operators. Uh, take uh, the Swedish example when uh, uh, Sweden, uh, Scandinavian Airlines used to be in Star Alliance cooperating with Lufthansa, for example. Now they are leaving Star Alliance, joining Sky Team. So we'll be working with KLM and Air France. Um, but maybe there will be lots of good uh, connecting flights through Frankfurt uh, that, that people have been used to take from, from, from Göteborg or Stockholm to. Uh, to to maybe to Asia and it makes more sense to to travel through Frankfurt or travel through Istanbul uh, and if we have good MDMS that will actually uh, make the aviation sector more efficient, more competitive and actually less uh, emissions and as a railway enthusiast I can get behind that as well. Jakob, I, I just wanted to add in there, uh, for, for, for the multi-choice of, of aviation, you have the third-party platforms, of course, today, where you can always filter down the shortest route, the, the best CO2 uh, alternative and so on. That is the third-party suppliers. But you are talking about going the, to the direct supplier of SAS or KLM and Lufthansa. Um, I actually like the idea to 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 have to force all suppliers to always show if there is a better solution environmentally better solution on a city pair that they choose and 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 I, so if you are doing the the paris marseille uh, you you're looking for the aviation it comes up if the train is a better choice it should state consider the train or or on this stretch you would be saving the planet x if you are taking a different type of transport we can implement that rule to all suppliers today to always have to identify a better choice if there is one that is one of those small steps i'm thinking of where we need to start and break the barrier of changing and doing something is to add that little label on everyone to say hey there is a better choice for this route consider it Food for thoughts. Indeed, and uh, oh, again, thanks to everyone coming in on the chat and the Q and A, which is a very there's a very lively debate going on there on bilateral agreements. For example, someone's posted the CER uh, website link on bilateral agreements, so do have a look there in the chat that function. Was me. Well, thank you, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jacob. You're being very busy today. We're keep we're we're keeping you very busy. Um, there's also a comment on a on a on a, a comparison map that exists between road and rail uh, and air options across Europe. So do be do everyone check out the chat function, the Q&A, lots of uh, questions and answers uh, there too. Uh, but we are coming to the end of uh, the webinar and if we can't get through all the questions, we will try and endeavor to contact people individually, but also do contact us uh, via our uh, website too. Um, we, um, we're we also coming to the end of your term, uh, Jakob, as an MEP. I, the, we don't want to talk about maybe what what how much time you want to be spending at home, which I'm sure will be one of your priorities. But what is the future for Jakob de Lunde, um as a as an active citizen? As you say, will will you continue to try and fight the good fight in other ways? Well, I hope to stay uh, on this uh, issue and connected issues 
and to be part of this journey, but in another uh, capacity. And I, I have I've had some some interesting uh, offers uh, already, but uh, I, I do hope to be part of the of the transport uh, sector uh, going forward. We very much uh, look forward to working with you in one capacity uh, or the uh, other, uh, Jakob. In terms of concluding remarks, I mean, stay, same with you, Jakob. Um, maybe something to inspire us with. You already told us the elections coming up and the hearings. This, this issue is very live and the parliament, we would seemingly have a lot of support and indeed within the commission, uh, member states more, more, more challenging. So maybe just two or three final words of advice for uh, the community who, as you say, are very animated by this. We have a lot of people on the call, a lot of comments. You know you've been to a lot of the meetings, very well attended. Just two or three concluding points in terms of how we can keep this issue alive. And, and as you say, make sure it is the focus of attention in the ma next mandate. Well, on so many other climate issues, we as Greens come as the boogeyman saying, you, you can't eat meat or you can't uh, use coal power, you can't do this. Um, and we're trying to, be, we're, we're like killjoys. All the fun things that you want to do in life, we, we, we have to be against it. But when it comes to this specific issue, there's such a, a yearning from millions of Europeans who want nothing more than the opportunity to travel sustainably. And it's the regulation, the lack of, uh, of, of choices from the operators that are standing in the way. And in Sweden, we have this Facebook group called Tog Semester Train Vacation, where more than 200,000 members have joined. And the question that they're as asking is not, why is, this, why is it so expensive to book the railway ticket? They're asking, how the hell do you book the ticket? And if we can just solve this issue, there are hundreds of thousands of Swedes and millions of Europeans that will hop on the next train and make the green transition uh, easier and more enjoyable. Well, thank you, Jakob, for that very uh, optimistic and inspiring uh, note to uh, slowly wind up and uh, conclude this uh, webinar. Um, Frederick, uh, do you have also have something inspiring and optimistic for us to uh, conclude the webinar on and to rise to the challenge that Jakob has laid down? That a lot of this is uh, something that the citizens really want action on, as I'm sure you do as a representative of the business community, of the business travel community in particular. Yeah. First of all, I would love to connect with you, Jakob, when you are moving back to, to, to Sumbi Bay in Stockholm in Sweden. And I hope that we can continue to, to drive this train uh, and, and, and development further together. Uh, I also want to say a few conclusive words. I'm actually in Umeå today where I took the train uh, for, for four hours uh, from Stockholm and I had a most lovely uh, uh, ride and I'm seeing the Swedish train company here tomorrow to talk about the future and, and how they will develop. So to conclude this is that every time I talk to anyone about this, everyone is positive. It makes sense. This is the way forward. Uh, we are building a, a future travel infrastructure here. Uh, the consumers are definitely ready. We hear you, Jakob. I, I, I hear it also. Our business travelers out there, they really want to have this as a part of their program. Uh, technology is there. Uh, and right, right now, I believe we have to focus on the legislation. Uh, we have to make it fair for all parties this and we have to push the boundaries to make those commercial programs so are so solid today to to loosen up and maybe see different lights and new types of revenues and new new commercial values in the future uh, the consumer law is absolutely super important uh, and it's difficult and complex to manage uh, and, and 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 this is where it has to be and why i believe where it, where the big difficulty in 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 eu is is to make it as fair as possible uh, BT for Europe, this is where we will come in. We will continue to feed uh, uh, EU and the MEPs with insights and, 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 and great alternatives. Uh, and we will continue to work in EU with expert groups, organizations to learn and support the program until we have a solution, until we are launching it uh, and, and, and this being put into a good effect. So I'm hoping to, to see a great development in the next year or two. Thank you. Well. Th thanks so much, for Frederick. Clear role of uh, BT for Europe in pushing this forward on the agenda for the for the for the next mandate. And indeed, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that BT for Europe are organising to try and make sure these issues are central to the European election campaign. 
Obviously, it's a very, very challenging geopolitical situation, but this is a key issue for those of us that want to try and tackle climate change and provide Europe with a, com a competitive business environment. So the next webinar will be on the digital transformation on the 25th of April at 10 uh, a.m. Uh, CET with uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Jakob uh, Dennis Ratka, MEP, and uh, one of our BT for Europe experts, uh, Christoph uh, Carnier. So we look forward to everyone registering again and joining us uh, for that uh, webinar. Uh, so this discussion, I'm sure, will continue as it will, I'm sure, offline and online uh, as well between Jakob, Frederick and, and, and the rest of us in terms of MDMS. So just really uh, is that for me to to thank in particular Jakob for, for joining us and showing us your insight, but also everything for everything you've done in terms of pursuing this issue uh, so uh, enthusiastically uh, uh, during this mandate and indeed your 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 work with BT for Europe over the last couple of years as well. Thank you to you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Frederick, uh, for sharing your insight and experience. And we look forward to obviously hearing from you in future webinars. Uh, and uh, Chair of BT for Europe, uh, Patrick, uh, too, for joining us early and setting out uh, the wider vision of BT for Europe. Thanks to our uh, sponsor Visa, without whom we wouldn't have been able to host this webinar. So thanks to them and indeed the BT for Europe team uh, behind the scenes who will make all this work so smoothly. Um, and above all, thanks to the audience, to the citizens, the businesses, the business travel organizers and organizations that supported us today to make this such a uh, an interactive event. And above all, thanks to all the tremendous questions and discussion we've stimulated online. And let's maintain this momentum and take it forward uh, to the next webinar on the 25th of April. Um, you can find out a lot more about BT for Europe on btforeurope.com. Thanks for your time. Have a good afternoon. Once again, thank you to thank you, you for very joining much, us. Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Have a great day. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jakob.